So I'm not sure if I'm going to upload this video or not, but I'm going to make it, I think. So a video popped up while I was listening to something, actually. And sometimes my own videos pop up, and I don't really watch them, and I'm, it's a bit, I'm a bit weird about it, but this one popped up. And I was discussing intersectionality, and it was about um, the difference between what Sally Hines calls intersectionality, which is narcissistic word salad, and um, intersectionality as the theory base around the evolution of systems and reflection on power dynamics that has emerged in systems dealing with abuse and violence, which largely is by women. And I said it was about reflection, because in a moment of crisis you're still a human being and you don't want this to be true. And I was talking about the hypothetical example of a 14-year-old who's been raped by her dad. And what I wanted to do, I, I, it had bothered me when I said it, and it bothered me when I went out, and I didn't... Uh, I felt it needed just um, thought. And then, as I was thinking about it, I realised that the stuff that I was thinking about, that it's actually within that reflection that you see the reality of systems analysis and where the systems analysis comes from in intersectionality. And so I thought I would try to explain it. So, you're sat there with, you know, a 14-year-old who's being sexually abused by her dad or you're realising that the 14-year-old in front of you is in the middle of um, child sexual exploitation and what that is. And um, I wanted to talk about some of the things that are actually running through your head at that moment because it's that reflection that helps you develop a systems analysis and it's that reflection that's at the core of intersectionality and developing this and, it, you know, it's largely your own failure. So you are, like, first of all, the human psyche is not supposed to look at child abuse. And one of the very difficult things when you deal with it all the time, especially if you deal with, like, you don't deal with very, very shocking things often in social work. It's actually, you know, most of it's quite mundane and it's about the impact of poverty and, you know, it's stress on families and it's not outright, you know, psychopaths. It's why the psychopaths are so easy to spot because they're kind of caught in various patterns. Whereas the rest of it follows different kinds because it's about life stress and it's about a bunch of other stuff. Which is, and what also you realise is that that actually does more harm. And it's this. And it's the realisation that actually most of it's really banal. But you become desensitised and your perspective accommodates these things as normal. So you have to reflect on that and actually actively watch out for that, which I do. So that's one of the first purposes of reflection. One of the other purposes is that you are embodying the power of the state and you have to understand the limits between you as a person and the state. And you have to not take responsibility for decisions that are not yours. You can only do what you are legally empowered to do. And you are not responsible. Those laws are a reflection of democratic will. You know, you are managing institutional and political tensions and you, you know, are the very, you are actually, you have to know the limits of your responsibility. You have to know that you did not decide that, that you fought tooth and nail and you thought that was the wrong decision and it's on record and you said at court that you thought it was, but that was not your decision. So there's a lot of that. You have to be able to reflect on the limitations of your responsibility because otherwise you'd go a bit mad. But in that moment where you are realising that this is like sexual abuse or grooming. What you've got is a situation where there might be even stability in it. There might even actually be outside this, there might be stability and you're about to take it all away. And what you're thinking about in that moment is the processes. So you're going to fill in the forms and you're going to contact the people, but what you're going to do is the minute you realise that, you're going to trigger processes that are deeply, savagely, abusively and traumatically harmful every step of the way, every single solitary step of the way for this girl. There is not going to be a single step of this that isn't catastrophically harmful. And you are going to be the person who is trying to make sure that all the other agencies do as they're supposed to do without harming her, and that's a lot of professionals. So, you know, you might have medical examinations, you might have police interviews, you might have you know, interviews with mental health professionals, CAMs, blah, 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 a million of other, and one of other things. And you've got to understand, especially in the case with grooming, which is the most devastating with grooming, um, is that actually quite a lot of those professionals are not going to give a fuck that this has happened to her and are not even going to see it as harmful. They're going to see her as culpable. And so you have to be behind the scenes with those professionals, making sure that they fucking understand that they will do their, bare, bare, their legal responsibility to this girl and they will not behave in a way that harms her and they will not do this. And you have to make sure that that happens in, behind the scenes 
while in front of the scenes, you have to make sure that this girl is getting a cohesive network of professionals who are working in her interests and that, you know, she feels within that process safe. And she's not safe within that process. She's not fucking remotely safe within that process. So, with child protection proceedings, it's bad because there are so many, you know, there's a lot of legal hoops to jump through, there's a lot of applications, there might be a new placement to sort, there might be a new home for her, that might be occurring, so you might have to manage that situation. Um, but behind the scenes, that's also a battle for resources. So she doesn't know that this battle's going on, you have to have this battle and it's unspoken and you have to be, you have to know that behind the scenes you are going to have to battle. And my ex-husband gave me a bit of advice when I started in social work, he says your assessment is not to tell about that child, it's to tell that manager what will happen to them if you do not get the resources that child needs. So this is all unspoken, the girl doesn't know this, but this is, and what you're running through in your head is the likelihood of success here. And you're going to unleash processes around this girl, around this terrible, terrible thing. And there's a fucking infinitesimally small chance that any of this is going to be beneficial for her. And you have to know just how many of these proceedings are not about her at all. But are about making adults feel better, or about adults getting rid of their legal responsibility and washing their hands. And you have to reflect on that realistically. Because, you know, these are very difficult processes that she's going to have to go through and you have to make sure not to make false promises to her about the likelihood of success because you're also dealing with power dynamics so the minute she makes this allegation the power dynamics between her and her abuser are exposed and while notably recently that's not the case with Asian abusers what's historically the case with most abusers and with white abusers and with everybody else is that that is a tally with everybody in their head an equation is this girl worth enough to disrupt this person and that's the question that she's going to be entering into. And the, the simple fact is, no, as far as most of these people are concerned, no. So once you shift to a criminal trial, so the balance of probability is the burden of proof with child protection. So everybody's working with, like, an error. You know, we understand that we're working with high levels of probability that there's probably, you know, that actually we're wrong, often, you know. Probably be, you're lifting a child from a situation where they're probably being harmed into a harmful one. And then when you go to criminal, it's beyond reasonable doubt. And what happens in those criminal trials is it's about her being put on trial to defend her abuser's identity. And if there's 10, 20 criminal trials, that's 20 criminal trials that she's in the middle of, that everybody is seeing her as responsible for. And as the cost of these is building up and all these professionals is getting under more and more pressure and as this process is building up, she is still in the fucking middle of it. And that's what you know will happen. And you're sat there in that moment and you've seen all this a million and one times and you know what's going to happen and you have to be able to navigate this. And that's what's going through your mind. That her saying this is that. And that you're going to help her manage through that. But you're not going to do it very well because you don't have the resources to do it. An abusive dynamic is a really odd one. Because it's generally made out of weakness. And it's generally somebody doing something they're ashamed of. And what your job is as a social worker is to make the unspoken spoken so that it can be addressed. And to see those power dynamics. And to be used to seeing them. And John Ozemek, in his description of how trans activists rely on that power so that, you know, nobody will challenge them. That's what abusive dynamics is. It's the power to say, this has to remain unspoken. Because the harm in speaking it, to me, would be too much. And that's what abusive dynamics re rely on. And that, that's the same in any abusive dynamic. One of the difficulties between me and a late woman at the moment is that they don't want to discuss austerity. Because they know austerity just happened. They know it was women like me caught up in it. They know they're in elite institutions. But they can't cope with that next step, which is actually we probably have to not only rectify our understanding of these systems, which they're doing, but we also possibly have to take responsibility for being part of this. And for the way that our reflex response is because of our culture and our institutions led to this. And this is largely the structure of abusive dynamics and the skill in the social worker's role in that is making the unspoken spoken. And that's what intersectionality is about. It's about reflection on power dynamics so that you can make the unspoken power dynamics spoken. 
and it's nothing to do with the narcissist. And through that, like, because it's crisis, because these are very intense situations, what you're developing is a systems analysis that's burned into you. A systems analysis that we desperately need, but that only actually works if government and academic institutions and policymakers are taking note of that systems analysis. This is not a systems analysis if it's just a person getting damaged by these systems. Unless that democratic link works all the way up the line, it doesn't work. And one of the processes that we're going through right now is that that understanding is shifting to elite institutions, and that's what the self-ID crisis is part of. But that's basically what intersectionality is for. It's so that you can work with power dynamics and challenge them and speak them because, and manage the damage that it does to you, being able to do that. And one of the reasons so many of us end up with complex PTSD is just that our, it's just a fancy way of saying our, our perspectives are a long way from other people's because we are familiar with these patterns and we see them structurally. And that makes, you know, things quite difficult. I don't know if I'm going to post that. I might watch it back, see what it's like.